In peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, when I was growing up, the phrase, no doubt, was popular. Maybe it still is, I don't really know. Uh, but it was, at least back then, pretty much a way cooler way to say, sure, or, or I agree. I also personally thought no doubt was a pretty cool phrase to say because a band called No Doubt was rocking the radio waves when I was in high school. Uh, but the phrase itself means there's no question, uh, or I'm with you 100%, or I totally agree. As John tells the story of Thomas, he's encouraging you and I to move in the direction of no doubt when it comes to our faith and belief in the resurrection. Today's story is about doubting Thomas. Yet if we rewind the Gospel of John a bit, it turns out that Thomas is actually, at points, a pretty reliable and also a straightforward kind of character. He says, when no one else is willing to say it out loud, he asks Jesus, uh, but Jesus, we don't know the way. What are you talking about? And Jesus goes on to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Even though Thomas thinks, and it turns out he's going to be right, that Jesus going to Jerusalem to, to meet to visit Lazarus who has died will be fatal for Jesus. Nevertheless, Thomas says to his brothers, let's go with him so that we may die with him. That's some loyalty. Uh, Thomas says that more out of solidarity at that point than out of faith. However, what Thomas says does turn out to be true, as is often the case in John's gospel, but not in the way that he anticipates it. When I uh, hear the name Thomas, I also can't help but think of uh, one of my friends from the seminary whose name was Thomas Manakaraj. And if you can't tell, you may not be, he was Indian. Uh, his father was a pastor in India, and he came to the Concordia Seminary in St. Louis and is a pastor now as well. He was named after Thomas because Thomas, tradition has it, Thomas traveled as far as India to share the gospel. Uh, instead of calling Thomas, doubting Thomas, perhaps we should show Thomas a little love sometimes. However, it's true, there's no doubt that Thomas does doubt. To be fair to Thomas, though, there's not a single character in the New Testament who expects Jesus to be alive on Easter. Even those who are, are really listening to Jesus Listening closely, folks like Mary or John himself, they're completely devastated by Jesus' death and, and are initially shocked and confused when they first see the signs of the resurrection. As we look closer at Jesus, in particular, his conversation with Thomas, the point that we should take away is not so much, tisk tisk Thomas, why didn't you just believe? No, rather, Thomas kind of helps us all with his questions. Thomas, even in the other points of the Gospel of John, Thomas has a way, it seems, of getting to the heart of the problem. And his demand for proof from Jesus certainly fits the bill. Having had my own share of doubts over the years, um, I've tried at least to employ a strategy of, of not condemning questions or nagging doubts, because you notice in the story what didn't convince Thomas, right? <laughs> his friends. His friends talked to him. Um, in this case, the apostles did not convince Thomas. He says, in fact, adamantly, I won't believe unless. The only thing that Thomas, that would convince Thomas was Jesus. Uh, Thomas said, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will, ne I will never believe. Well, Jesus gave Thomas that proof. He gave Thomas exactly what Thomas needed in order to have faith. And still today, Jesus will give us what we need in order to have faith. Now, there are legitimate reasons that people doubt. I think most people in our world today with all that's going on and you know, all, all the 
you know, technology and, and everything, almost everybody has doubts at some point or the other. But it, and that's okay because our faith is a reasonable faith. Promoting a blind faith is what Christians believe can actually backfire on us. There's a time where we have to walk where we don't see what's next and, and where we have to proceed with, you might say, blind faith. But our faith in total is not a, a blind faith that just close your eyes to the outside world and what everyone tells you and believe despite all the evidence to the contrary. Um, one reason that, that blind faith can be a problem is no one really wants to be around unreasonable people, right? <laughs> Plus, if we believe in an unsubstantiated faith, this can lead Christians to being susceptible to all kinds of crazy or wacko or unhealthy religious beliefs or cults. Sometimes people say that phrase, and it can be used in different ways, but the way it's sometimes used, you got to have faith, uh, can sort of be not helpful, as if the solution to doubt is just to shut your eyes. However, on the other hand, Tom, Jesus does tell Thomas, the goal is not to continue in doubt, but to believe. Uh, doubts certainly arise, and I don't think it helps anybody to demonize those who have doubts. But on the other hand, it's dangerous to live in doubt for too long. You might say, and this is true of doubt in just about anything, get an answer to your questions or doubt will drag you into disbelief. Uh, it's uncomfortable to be in, in a really heightened state of doubt. And so the good thing about that is it usually drives us to decide one way or the other. What Jesus doesn't want us to do is to just kind of give up because we have these doubts and tensions and just to throw in the towel and say, ah, I'm not even trying anymore. Um, if you have doubts, well, you're in, in good company. But what Jesus wants and what he invites us to do is to actually look closer at the questions you have, to get up close to Jesus and God's word. Because I, for one, I believe that Jesus can handle the scrutiny. The question is, can we handle Jesus being close to us? Um, sometimes the most helpful thing to do is, or most helpful thing to say is not just believe, but it's better often simply to point people to Jesus. All the comments of the disciples didn't really help Thomas. However, hanging out with Thomas did lead, it turns out, to Jesus appearing to Thomas. Now, sometimes that's the way it is with us, too. Sometimes we can't convince others. But inviting them to be with us, or even with fellow Christians, can sometimes help people see Jesus better than any argument. In fact, throughout John's Gospel, whether it be John the Baptist, the first disciples, or this Samaritan woman, Jesus gives us, or John, or Jesus, whoever you want to say it, gives us repeated examples of people who become disciples, not through argument, but through introduction. And that's typically, typically I mean, no, not every situation is the same, but generally, that's a good mission or evangelism type of advice introduction over argument. I wish you could argue people into the faith. I've tried arguing people into the faith, uh, but it usually ends up as a failure to communicate. Um, but it's not only my failed attempts. Studies show that often when we get into arguments, odds are people are more likely than not to you encourage people to become more entrenched in their position when you argue with them. I would imagine that's especially true when the argument gets, um, you know, heated. Maybe I'm not, maybe that's not true. But in general, you're more likely to have people entrenched in their position by just straight up arguing with them. Um, those of us, and I include myself in this because I like a good discussion or even a good argument, we like to assume that we're very logical. But at least at times, it might be more true to say, that we are combative. <laughs> we have a vested interest in being right because 
When we argue, we're afraid that we'll look bad or, or be punished. Uh, the mere idea of losing motivates us to, to push back, no matter how good or true the argument may be. It's, and, and it's just much easier, I think, psychologically, to simply pick a side instead of actually listening or learning. I mean, think about it. When someone tries to argue you out of a position, their goal is to convince you, right? And so, of course, if they're trying to convince you, they give you all these reasons to agree with them. <laughs> but sometimes the opposite happens. Even though all the information they've put in front of you is trying to encourage you uh, to a new position, we end up uh, digging our heels in. Uh, we walk away perhaps more convinced than ever that they are wrong and we are right. Um, if you want to win an argument, uh, then go for it. You know, attack, we might say. Um, but if our goal is not to win an argument, but to introduce people to Jesus, then we have to show them him. Remember, I think, uh, again, there's some exceptions, but generally, introduction over argument. I mean, which would you rather do? Get into an argument with somebody or meet somebody new, meet somebody interesting? Proclaiming Jesus is alive, uh, uh, showing people Jesus is typically far more effective than, than arguments or discussion. Now, unlike the apostles, we can't promise Jesus will just show up in our living rooms, at least not in the same way that he does for Thomas. How, however, um, thank God for Thomas because he was skeptical so that we can all see that Jesus did provide proof, at least for his apostles. Um, well, and if we want to introduce people to Jesus, well, John's gospel is, is one of four really good ways, not the only ways, but one of four really good ways to introduce people to Jesus. And I, I particularly like John's gospel, and one of its strengths is, is that it's personal. And because there's so many one-on-one -on -one conversations with individuals that Jesus has, it really can get to the heart of a lot of things that we still talk about today. Um, Jesus begins conversations regarding the same sorts of questions and concerns that lots of people are dealing with uh, today. Uh, places like Bible studies or, or worship services can also be great opportunities where we, we don't individually have to do all the heavy lifting ourselves. We introduce people to Jesus in the same way that we encounter him in worship. It's not the only way, but it is one way. Um, Many of you know this and have heard it before. I'm, I'm probably not, you know, as I talk about going to Bible studies or church, this is probably not groundbreaking information to anybody. Um, but today is perhaps more of a simply an encouragement uh, to make it a priority or to invite others to come with you as you go to a small group Bible study, perhaps. Uh, when we bring people, when we bring Christ into our own lives, or, or witness others who bring Jesus into their lives, uh, Jesus is present. So you could say, and not exactly in exactly the same way, but Jesus can be present in our living rooms as we speak about Him, as we dimly, perhaps, but nonetheless, maybe reflect His love and light to others. Um, and, and there's some simple, and I say simple, not necessarily always easy, but simple ways to show people Jesus. And one is, when admitting mistakes, um, when, when admitting our mistakes is not limited to once a week at a church service, but when we do it amongst one another, I mean, I think that's refreshing, to, not just to Christians, but to the world. Um, people encounter Jesus and the gospel when they see that Christians not just talking about forgiveness, but when they're offering people forgiveness in their real lives. Loving our neighbors and our enemies is a good philosophy, and I mean, who's going to disagree with it? But when churches actually do it, uh, people take note. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, the, of negativity and, and things that people say against the church, but if we actually live out our faith, I think e even the bad press will be overwhelmed um, by the positive, by the love of Christ when it's 
really reflected in our lives. Um, and I think and not just when it is, but as it is reflected in our lives. Uh, the question perhaps that we ought to be asking ourselves is not only what reasons are you giving people to believe in Jesus, but perhaps even more importantly, how are you showing people that they should believe in Jesus? Well, Jesus encourages Thomas to doubt no more. And there is a kind of doubt that should be banished from our lives. Maybe to be more precise, it might be more helpful to think about it, not as doubt, but we don't really want to tolerate disbelief. And what I mean by that is disbelief, right? Belief is an active thing and disbelief is, is resisting believing. And I'm talking about when we doubt because we want to give up. When we use doubt as a convenient excuse to help us do something that we know that our faith says we really shouldn't. It's doubt, we, it's the doubt we embrace uh, when we want to throw in the towel because it would be easier, because our lives would be simpler if we just abandoned living out our faith. Disbelief is the doubt that says, rather than trust God and his promises, I'm going to do what I want without waiting or trusting in God's plan. And that is the kind of doubt that, our, that we want, that we need to get rid of. After we confess that we are sinners, and after all, I should say, after all, we confess that we are sinners. Even our desires, our inclinations, and our doubts are at times self-serving. Listen to our Lord, to your Lord and Savior, and, and turn away from doubt. And the way to do that is not simply by like digging deep and trying harder to believe. No, the way to turn away the opposite of doubt, you might say, is not belief as much as it is, it is simply turning to Jesus. Think of the man whose son needed to be cleansed of a demon, and Jesus says, do you believe? And the man says, Lord, I do believe. Help me with my unbelief. And that might be what we need to do when we have doubt. The best thing to do is, is not necessarily to try to dig within ourselves, but simply to turn to Jesus, to fall on Jesus, to pray to Jesus to help us. Um, there is a time to run away from doubt and instead run to Christ. There is a time to no longer hold on to or embrace doubt, but rather cling to Christ. Embrace our Savior and say with Thomas, my Lord and my God. In Jesus' name, amen.